one hand in speak. That is what is recorded in the history. The whole year the Kawaka just met one beard that is made white man. <laughs> seconds a child is dying of malaria in Africa now to get the dose of life-saving uh, um, anti-malaria is about five dollars but there's no government to give anti anti-malaria uh, when somebody gets malaria if they have no money they get ill and die so my quest the question that I was asking and many people were asking was if you really want to help children why begin with a disease that they don't have? Why, why not go home? Why not look for something that is killing them? This is, this is Ox Oxford, Cambridge, where you go to get this degree where you get the first degree, which is a, a BA, bachelor's degree. You know, they don't believe in marriage. So they don't, you know, the only thing they can give you is a bachelor's degree, you know? So, so, because you can stumble on a conference like this and get shocked when a few ideas are thrown in your head. I don't believe what Nana Sekhmet said. I don't believe that kind of stuff. It's okay. You know, they teach you how to critique, not to believe anything. You know, when they say, when they, when, when they, they say, uh, what do you think about black people building their own institutions? You say, well, is it has its own advantages and disadvantages. <laughs> um, the high culture of Egyptian civilization that starts around the Nile Valley eventually ends up here in the Giza Plateau, in the pyramids of Giza, one of the highest high technical civilizations that African people put together, starting all the way from Uganda, covering present day Sudan, and going up here in Egypt.
was established that more than seven million years ago, a black woman stretched forth her hands under God and gave us the first human being. In the beginning was a black woman. This black woman lived at the foothills of the mountains of the moon. This black woman lived in the Idracrostin region known in ancient time as the land of the gods. This black woman lived at the source of the Nile. This black woman lived between the two domes of the Great Rift Valley. This black woman's genes run through the genes of every human being. This black woman's DNA is the string that connects every person that walks on earth. That is why we say that let him that is worthy be worthy still, and let him that is righteous be righteous still. So behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give unto every man and woman for and according to his reward should be. For in the beginning was a black woman. This woman gave rise to a human. Never was a time when a black woman was not. Never will be time when black people will cease to be. Because we are eternal, my brothers and sisters. Ethiopians. Let them think of invading the country of the long lived Ethiopians. Until then, they should thank the Almighty for not diverting the minds of the Ethiopians to foreign countries. Now, in all the wars that you are fighting, when African people are being invaded by Europeans, most of them trained in all these so called prestigious institutions, you will find that our forefathers, who didn't speak English like we do, who didn't know the world, didn't have internet, didn't have mobile phones, who did not watch television, in most cases they outfought, outgeneraled, outmarshaled some of the best military brains Europe had to offer. Chetuswayo Kampandezu, he did not go to school, he did not go to West Point and Thanhast. I cannot understand the concept of Thanhast. And my misunderstanding is scientific because it is based on what we call the law of parsimony, also known as Ekam's laser. When you have several contradictory issues around a certain subject, you think about the simplest. I have watched an interview with a man who said he trained Idi Amin as King's African Rifles. I have that interview. And he said that this to see Idi Amin carrying uh, military hardware ahead of his troops always gave him confidence. And he says he met Idi Amin just before the coup and Idi Amin told him what he was going to do. Now, if you are trained in West Point, I also saw an interview recently by somebody at West Point talking about General Kagame and how they were fighting in Rwanda. And he said that they were, he was always on phone reporting to her. Uh, 
what are we doing? If I was coming here, I was thinking, you don't have to answer to tell me. Do we really have plan B and plan C? Because really, if I send my head of intelligence to go and train at Thunhurst, to be trained by the same people who are going to invade me tomorrow, what am I doing? And then he comes and remains the head of intelligence. What am I doing? And then he boasts of how he trains the service and he hangs his photograph on the wall so that when you come you see him with white trainers standing by his side saying, I did it, I trained. <laughs> when he came to ask me yesterday and he says, what, what, uh, what, what should I say about your qualification? I'm saying to myself, am I going to stand on a platform and say, I, I studied, uh, I have a degree from Manchester. How, how can I be so proud that my oppressor, I took the University of Leeds to court for miseducating me. I lost, but I tried. <laughs> how am I going to stand here and boast about how I trained? You know, you walk in Kampara, on Kampara Road, eh? you see somebody says, Ero Ero D London, yeah? that he attained his degree in law in London. Yet the same institution is glorifying in the same that stole land from the Kabaka, from the Banyoro. Eh? They stole it and made it illegal, made the theft illegal. Started in America, that stole that country from the dark skinned Native Americans. You steal, uh, you, you steal something, they put you in jail. They stole a country and got away with it. So there has to be something strategically, at the strategic level, which we have considered because we have seen it time and time again. When you say laboratory rap, repeating the same thing, they throw something at the dance and try to catch it, repeating the same thing, then you know it existed at the level of the laboratory rap. When you saw that the head of uh, Gaddafi's intelligence was working for MI5, he was working for Mossad, he was working for the CIA. Mobutu, he was paid one million dollars by, by, by America to remove because the soldiers were not being paid. So they passed through Mobutu, who had been handpicked by Rumumba. He was a journalist. He made him the Secretary for Defense. They went together to a conference in Belgium. He comes, the Americans get to him, pay him one million dollars. He pays the troops. They fire up behind him, removes President Mobutu. There is nothing new. If you are trained by your oppressor, you will only react like the oppressor. And when the oppressor decides that you should be removed, then he has those loopholes inside us. You can't tell me that a hundred of us will all go and be trained by Americans, and then at the same time, they will not whisper to one of us. The car. You know, being a soldier doesn't mean that you don't recognize a nice phone, or you don't want to fly in a plane, or you don't want your girlfriend you know, to live in a very nice area. No, they buy us with our own money. Why? Because the foundation is set by us to say that really, if you could go in the bush with seven guns, come and overthrow a government of all these generals, General Owing, El Kodua, trained in Thunder, trained, why they are better soldiers trained than Mubutu soldiers. Sijui, commander, wa commander, train at West Point, then Van has then every institution you could think about. Didn't you travel as UPDF from north, from the north to Mbandaka in about two weeks? A country larger than Europe. Do you really need experience from Europeans and Indians? I don't think so. You need your own experience. So, and you need to keep it your own so tight so that your enemy doesn't even know your plan. But the enemy now, they will just go and say, I says, I know what they will do because I'm the one who told them. I said, if you enter through this door, one of them should stand here, another one should go there. It's done. You see it every day. They look for who trained them. What do they think? What will be they say? They don't want taxes. They don't want laws. They want to come in and have diplomatic immunity. If you are the head of Barclays, 
When you come in Uganda, the army will give you protection. Government, corporations, the so-called MTA, you know, the Horizon, Vicecom, Apple, Microsoft, Walmart, they have become, these transnationals, they have become governments of their own, secluded governments of their own. Above these transnationals is banks. Banksters. They are the ones who decide, we don't want this leader, let us torpedo the economy. And they do. Citizens go on the street. They are the ones who decide, oh, this government is not going to give us a good agreement for oil revenue. They almost did this in Uganda uh, at the end of this election. If you were blind, you didn't see it. But the aim was go on the street, overwhelm the government, they will not shoot, the cameras will be there, And the government will fall. Why? Because Taro Oil wanted an agreement that the government couldn't give. And they were standing by to cause the same confusion they have, they have done in Egypt. Luckily, some people were awake. It didn't happen. But all these things that you see that were walk to work, was not walk to work. It was work to government. It was work to government and it was almost successful. Because you know what they were doing? Strategically in America, in the US, the army has got its own radio, TV, radio, TV, internet, everything. The armies around the world are almost a government of their own. Control public opinion. It is only recently that you have started having uh, spokespersons. But do you have a newspaper? No. What happened to your Teresita? Is it still there? Teresita, is it there? Yes. Uh, with a few copies uh, that comes on a tiny little office. Eh? <laughs> really? What did you take government for? African people don't know how to handle power. You get power, you give it to somebody else. <coughs> you give it to Sudir. Then, you start uh, Wazalendo and uh, all them down. You should have taken UCB as a bank. Strategically. So that if you see a journalist that is like this, you call him. You say, what's your problem? What is your problem? Then you tell this person and you say, you know, this man, his children go to a very poor school and it will have implications on the, on the politics and the, and the security of the country. Make sure he goes to a good school. That is what white people do. They take all the journalists to America, to Britain, to wherever, and whisper in their ears. Before you might start writing everything, government is bad, government is bad, government is bad. Why? Because you are sleepy. You. Power is for taking. And I told the president one time, I said, if you don't want it, give it to somebody who deserves it. Give it to me. I don't want to be there. A president and I even fail to have money to fund an election. No agricultural bank. No, imagine there was a story where uh, in the newspaper where the president said he wanted to borrow money and then he had to call uh, uh, the government of Stanbic who didn't uh, uh, act well and then he called Sudi. Hey, president! Who took over power after spilling blood? And then you create the whole environment and benefit for everybody. And then you end up sleeping in Mama India Pori. You are fucked. <laughs> you blame yourself. You know, 
the Catholics, they say, no banza wanji, no banza wanji. It's my fault, it's my fault, it's my fault indeed. You are not serious. You know, either you are afraid, or you don't see yourself as capable. You should, you should, I mean, there is a story too. This one, I don't know whether it is true. No, it is. Because Jim was told me the story that he had shares in the bank, Crane Bank, when it was being founded. And he was ordered to sell those shares, 20%. Jim was a military man. Why wouldn't you say, okay, sell it to the army? Where is your bank? Where is your radio? Where is your TV? Where is your national newspaper that you ensure is in every region? How do you control opinion? Where is your support system? I have only seen Wazaredo in very nice cars. I don't know, I mean, it must be doing well. Because I've seen, this is also the thing about us. It's the difference between a mercenary and a soldier. A mercenary works for money, a soldier works for a cause. How are you going to start a credit saving society and then buy a car straight away of 160 million? What's that? I've seen Wazaredo, 160 million cars, and I haven't seen one. All profit gone like this. So our societies do not know how to handle power. That is why Meles Zanawi must be moved every day. He knew what to do with power. You, you, who took all the power here, who brought all this peace that we're enjoying, you have just agreed to drink at the cup of European propaganda, of democracy, which they don't have. Democracy. By the people, for the people. How many people? If me and my wife have a government, are we not people? Is that not democracy? <laughs> Even current logically, wow, who cares? Yeah. Where is it? He was born in England. You ask him if there is England, he put democracy there. In those streets of, of, of Washington or New York, ain't no democracy there. Where out of a population, America's population, 12% black people, 12%, more than 38 million. But one in every three go through the criminal justice system before the age of 21. We are 12% of the population there, but 80% of the people in jail. Is that a democracy? Is it a democracy that class five black people are three-fifths of the man? Is it a democracy? Democracy is where is based on what? Permanent opposition. Permanent opposition. There is a leader of opposition even before he knows what to oppose. He stands there. What is your role? I am the leader of opposition. What are you opposing? I don't know yet. But when it comes in parliament, I'll be standing by to oppose it. Isn't that madness? Isn't it crazy? How then does a military, a government that comes through military training and military ranks, accept that? Because you are afraid that they will call you undemocratic. But it's an army in care. He played a few things there. He built the largest dam, largest dam, using resources from that country. We have paid Madvan one of the richest people on earth, 1.2 billion to build the Bujagari. I'm not praising myself, but the last time I met the president, we argued about the railway. And I said, our forefathers built the railway with their hands. And he says, we have the army, it is going to build the railway. But we I don't know. I haven't seen him since. But I don't know what you are doing. A railway. People built it. They put the soil together. They compact it. You know, they put trucks. That's a railway line. We don't have capacity to run a train so that it runs in time. Even when the trucks exist. Why are we calling Egyptians to come and run a railway for us? What? Are you so busy with them in your barracks every day that you can't even afford to run a coach and sit there and drive it? Are we? Or you don't speak. Or you don't analyze these things. 
what you are trying to imagine, you should have corporations. In America, they have what they call um, military industrial complex. That has also become a problem for the world. But in the military that really runs most of these corporations. They are the ones who manufacture this and manufacture that and place themselves here and place themselves here and make the wealthy. What about us? Why are you running everything else but you are not running that business side of controlling your own economy to make it remain in your own hands? I only know one industry in the world. I don't know any. If you have it, you don't have to tell me. If you don't, then God save Uganda and its population. This is what you should put in your papers. This is what you should write. When the president comes here, this is your hands should be up. You should be able to say, we need the railway, we need the radio, we need television, we need distribution systems, we need it. We need it so that we are able to project ourselves on the society in Uganda, to get into people's minds, to hire the best lecturers, to get into the minds of the journalists because this is how they sabotage the country. We need to produce food and distribute food. We need to have silos. Food. The Romans came to Africa looking for food, invaded Africa looking for food, kept North Africa at the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. When the Vandals and the Genesaric conquered North Africa and ruled it for a hundred years, it led to the corruption of the Roman Empire. Because they couldn't produce food anymore. Where are your silos? How long Canada can keep its citizens going for 150, 200 years if food production stopped? Europe can do 120 years. They have got food mountains. They buy food and stock it. It is junk food, but it can keep them going. How long can you, our defenders, honorable men of Chimaka, how long can you keep us going if food production is stopped in Uganda? What are you going to say? Look in your granary. There's a few bananas. <laughs> food security. Food security produced by you. It doesn't matter, regardless of what other people do. If you're a man, you have to stand up first. In Uganda now, I am not saying this because you are here. It is generally accepted outside, even by the opposition, that the best disciplined and organized institution in Uganda is the army. Are we also going to have the best broke institution, the most poor, you know, is the army? I know people who own, I know one man in Mubendi who has 35,000 cows, 35,000, one man. How many cows does the army have? How much land does the army have? And surely you know that every government wants to keep the army happy. But power concedes nothing without demand. It doesn't. It never will, never have. That's what Frederick Douglass said when he was fighting his way out of slavery in, in America. That's what two Salam Veto who are talking about African societies and keeping our own indigenous knowledge and keeping our own experience intact to ourselves. And the best example I can give you is that of Haiti that you see now with these aspects that are man-made. Earthquakes that you see today are man-made in Alaska. And I did forget. Please remind me of the earthquake. I want to show, I want to present the evidence that there is technology that exists that makes earthquakes. That makes free. He told the slaves to throw away the gold of white people who have so long oppressed us and speak the African spirit within them. These slaves of Haiti were able to defeat 150,000 Frenchmen commanded by Napoleon's brother Lalette. 
1781. Now, Tusa al Natua, who had been a slave, raised, given some education by one of his slave masters, and therefore he trusted slaves, he trust, trusted slave masters. He thought that there were some good white people that were good. This is what they did. One of the French commanders comes to Tusa al Natua in Haiti. He invites him to a, a, to a, a dinner on a boat. Tusa goes. They remove his sword. They ask him to leave his bodyguards. He enters the boat. He sits on a beautiful dinner with wine and everything, and there is all praise. The boat is sailing away. As he ate, the boat was sailing. They took him to France to meet Napoleon. He was detained in jail, and he died in jail. The next general who came after Tusa he was called Desiree. He didn't make a mistake. No, he killed everything white that wasn't right that was in sight. And he made Haiti free. Changed the name from Sandoman to Haiti. If they caught you and you didn't look African, if you are an African sympathizer, you were gone. The same lesson was repeated in China during the so-called Cultural Revolution. I don't know whether you have studied China and the Cultural Revolution. I had the president recently talking well about China. But during the Cultural Revolution, every Chinese who had a PhD, a master's degree, studied in London, had this chateau, had this. They were all rounded up and sent to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what would happen? Your own son would be called upon to do the honors. There were so many people killed, they thought China was going to collapse. But there were no more Uncle Tom's there. They had been rid of. Today, China is what it is. The mentality is straight. You either work for China, or you are looking forward to China, or you are not one of us. Sometimes, when a nation calls, you have to take difficult decisions. You know, we say that Christians and Muslims die to go to heaven, but we die to leave a name. Long after our bodies have turned to dust, only our names will survive. What will they say? What will they say? That you came and made this safe country safe for Barclays and started Chartered Bank and APSA? That you made it safe for, uh, for all these telecom companies? While your people sat in squalor holding a sugar? Is that what it's going to say? That you are an army that promotes and protects multinational companies? To make the country safe. Safe for who? At least if uh, it's a country that uh, is like Somalia, you know nobody's taking except in Angola. Angola, they had, uh, they had uh, oil, which is in, in the shore, in the lake. So all these multinational companies came and camped in the lake, started drilling oil. So you could kill each, each other on land, but nobody cared. There were a group of, uh, recently, I think it's three months ago, three years ago, a group of mercenaries from South Africa that were going to take over a country, uh, Equatorial Guinea, is it Equatorial Guinea? The one that were arrested in Zimbabwe. Yeah, mercenaries, that's their job. They, they, they had Mark Thatcher, you know, Mark Thatcher, the son of Margaret Thatcher, and this uh, author, what is his name, the author that went to jail? The, the, the Archer. Jeffrey Archer, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure you know the story. But they sat down and they said, this country has an army of 500. Now, if we can marshal enough troops, we can obviously go and take it over and share the oil. And they did everything. Except this time in South Africa, some of the people there, you know, are people like us. So they passed on the information to Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe passed on the information to the, 
They had left, some had gone as tourists, some had gone and set up some business doing repair work, some. But when they got to Zimbabwe, Sekeramai, he said, you are not going anywhere. Just stay here for a while. Biggest, why are you rushing? <laughs> they arrested them. If you are a man, you don't have land, you have not put a house and grown some food and a small farm, nobody gives you respect. Because you don't have it, it's not yours. The African institution was an entire economy. It had a justice system. Grandfather, the head of the Supreme Court. It had a sewage system. You all down the toilet and put it away from the house. Because you know the most modern, modern methods of, uh, of sewage distribution is really terrible. You have a house, the toilet is there. Sometimes you knock on somebody's door, you enter, you say, where is daddy? They say, he's in there. <laughs> <laughs> in your own house? Eh? And then you hear a horrible smell. Uh, you know that that is European technology. Eh? Now, even that sewage, you know where it is sent? It is sent into a lake. And you know, traditional Africa, if you spoiled a well, if you contaminated the well, it was the worst thing that you could have done. But in our own setting, you had your own toilet. You had a granary for food security and you kept food to last at least two years. We, did, we knew how to run an economy, even at the micro level. Why can't we replicate that same experience and put it at the national level? And why can't you, men of Chimaka, that were the leaders at that time, also provide that leadership? Lastly, I want to say to you, Professor Francis Grace Wilson, you can write this name, Francis Grace Wilson. Wilson is W-E-L-S-I-N. She wrote a book called The ISIS Papers. She's a leading psycho psychologist, clinical psychologist in America. Francis Chris Wilson. Francis Chris Wilson. She wrote a book called The ISIS Papers. In ISIS Papers, she says, white people hate black people. Number one. The reason white people hate black people is because white people are not black people. Three. If you know this about white people, you need not know anything else. Number four, if you don't know this about white people, anything else about them will confuse you. White people hate black people. The reason white people hate black people is because white people are not black people. If you know this about white people, you need not know anything else. If you don't know this about white people, anything else about them will confuse you. I know that for a fact that black people love white people. When you have an album of pictures, the first picture is where you are a white person. The white person could be very far, but it will be there in the background. Now, Professor Leonard Jeffries, he says you can't trust white people. That we tell our colleagues who have married across the line that even while you sleep, you must keep one eye open. If you are married to a white person, that is. Now, white people have invented all these things to stop you looking at them and talking about them and what they have done. Of all the things they don't want you to talk about is slavery. They want to say it's in the past. Oh, it's in the past. Don't talk about slavery. That is in the past. But look at the queen. Is she not seated on that throne based on her recollection of her history? the Queen of England, and talk about democracy. Is England a democracy when it is Her Majesty's government? Does the Queen change? Is she voted out of office? Isn't she there every day? Does she ask for a second term or does she have a term limit? Britain is ruled by Her Majesty's government. Even when they select the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister has to present himself before Her Majesty's government. And if you ever have a British person telling you about democracy and the third term and God knows whatever, they used to scare you, 
said to him, how many times has her majesty gone? They would say, oh, but that is different. You say, I know, because ours is different too. <laughs> because you have studied them. But Britain is ruled by her majesty. America is ruled by the so-called committee of 12 who run the Federal Reserve. Now, the point I'm saying to you is this. European institutions have invented all the sorts of things to hold you back from talking about them. One of the things they have invented is racism, prejudice. They say, well, he's racist. And at first it used to bother us. You know, somebody says you are racist and you say, oh no. Then eventually you begin to say, oh yeah, I'm racist. Uh -huh. So many people have profited out of it. Especially Europeans. Europeans invented racism. I didn't come and snatch African people from Africa. You did. I didn't come and colonize you. You did. I didn't come and miseducate you. You did. Now, how dare you call me a black person racist? But in psychology, when you have one finger pointing at somebody like this, you have three fingers pointing at you. So you're saying, I'm you are racist, you are racist. But the fingers are saying, no, 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 sir, you, you three times, you are racist. Racism means prejudice plus power. Prejudice plus power. Prejudice comes from the Latin word prejudicium, which means to judge before the fact. To judge before the fact. Is it not a fact that we were kidnapped and taken to the Americas and taken to, 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 to Oman and Iran and Iraq and all those countries? It is not, there is no single African who doesn't have their ancestors or their relatives kidnapped from Africa and taken into slavery. In fact, Arab slavery preceded European slavery. And Arab slavery was in a way worse than European slavery. Because African people in their millions who went to them, Arab countries, the men were castrated so they don't produce. So they disappeared. Whereas our people who went to America could reproduce and have families under extreme dehumanizing conditions, those who went to the Arab countries totally disappeared. The women were kidnapped and taken into harems to be raped and sodomized every day. So our people went through that Holocaust. But really, if you think that this is in the past, then look at Darfur. Look at the Luba Mountain. Because we African people today, we have a wrong understanding of God and we have a wrong understanding of religion. We assume that if you are a Muslim, that then Arab racists will leave you alone. It is not true. In Darfur, our people are being killed for their color, even though they are Islamic. There's a difference, of course, between Islam and Muslim. A Muslim means technically one who submits to the will of Allah. And Islam is a culture. When you wear Arab garb, that is not Islam. That is Arabism. Because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was very skillful in coining that religion. He built within it an economic arm that forever will make you tie to Saudi Arabia and Arab nations. Because he said, remember the Prophet, the history of the Prophet. The Prophet ran an inn, Hadija, his wife, run a hotel. Now, when you run a hotel, what, do you, what are you looking for? Customers, clients. If Chimaka comes and says, we have a seminar for two days, that means a lot of money for you. So the prophet said, every Muslim must visit Mecca once in a lifetime. How many clients are those for a hotel? <laughs> and he ensured that when they visit Mecca, they don't just say, okay, I have stepped in Mecca, I am in the next place. No, you spend enough time, you have to stop around the Kaaba. You have to drink at the secret word of Zimzim. You have to throw stones at the devil. 
You have to pay a visa to Saudi Arabia, fly Royal Saudi Airlines. You need an interpreter. You need to stay in a hotel. You have to buy books. You have to buy Muslim insignia. If Saudi Arabia would survive even without oil, based on the fact that all the Muslims, if they ever wanted to go to Saudi Arabia, they wouldn't even have beds to contain them. That is religion. Because religion carries with it an express, express condition of economic advancement. If you are Catholic, if you start a church, you need a bear, you need a piano, you need all this, you need the robes that they wear. Where do you think they come from? So the man who sits there making robes for a Catholic priest, you think he'll ever go out of business as long as they are Catholics? No! So there is a difference between Arabism, which is being promoted everywhere. Do you need, does God, can't God accept me as a Muslim praying in Uruguay? Do I really have to say to him, to speak to him in Arabic? And what about if I'm fighting a Muslim, uh, an Arab, and he prays uh, in Arabic, and I also pray in Arabic to the same God, and his Arabic is fluent, without accent, than mine? Who shall God listen to? I believe you know, as men of Chumaka at the senior army college, that Egypt had three battalions ready to invade Uganda that even speak Uganda. Because they believe that unless they have the knife in their hands, Egyptian security is not secure. When you go to Egypt and you're traveling in Lakso, uh, Aswan, and you say you are from Uganda, the majority of Egyptians don't know who you are. But security, if you mention Uganda, one time I was filming in, uh, in, in uh, Giza, Giza uh, at the pyramid of Giza. And you are supposed to pay $12,000. Uh, so they arrested me for filming. They wanted me to pay $12,000. I said, I'm not. So they said they were going to co co confiscate the equipment. Because, you know, you pay $12,000 to film in the pyramid. You get there, it is dark. Then you pay $50 for the light. But then they say the light is not allowed. And they tell you after you have paid. So it's all, it's a, a syndicate. So I said to them, you know what? You can take the camera. But I come from Uganda. And when I go back, we shall divert that river through Karamoja. And I have the authority to do it. Straight away, they took me to their commander. And they said, well, yeah, I don't mind. You can keep the camera. But when I go back, you shall see. <laughs> I can see the river being diverted into Karamoja to water all that arid area. And straight away he gave me permission to film, not only at Giza, but also at, 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 at uh, the stake in Sakar. Sakar. They allowed me to film. I filmed everything. And I kept the money for the filming rights. Why? Because the army in Egypt understood that one day they had to fight Uganda. By making me a friend, maybe I can help them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the, the concept of Arabism and Islam must be understood. These Arabs are fighting and killing our people in Darfur, in the Nuba Mountains, in Nigeria. Today, if you are black in the north, you will be captured and you will be taken into slavery. And this is today. It is not yesterday, it is today. Thankfully, thanks to you and to the people of Sudan, at least now there is a buffer between Uganda and southern Sudan. But the concept of Egypt, and if you go to Egypt, I don't know whether you, you travel to Egypt, you will know that really, if you are in Egypt, you'd have nothing else to do. You have the Nile, and then a couple of kilometers this side, that's where they grow food, and a couple of kilometers the other side, and after that it is a desert. So how are you supposed to survive if Uganda cuts off the water? That is strategic importance. Water, the next wars will also be about water, and that is why uh, the commandant, I brought you a documentary on water wars, so that we can share it with our brothers. They recognize the importance of fresh water. Who controls this resource? Who owns it? In America now, they are starting even to look at 
if you grow rice in America that is not supposed to be sold in America and you are exporting it, there is a tax for water because that rice you have grown with fresh water which you are exporting to another country. But we are seated around all this water in strategic importance with the butter, even without doing anything. In 2000, I developed the concept of water. Our water must be sold to the Arabs in the north and exchanged for oil. Their argument was water is a natural, is a, is a natural resource, but so is oil. If you want, you can keep your oil. We shall keep our water. We shall see how long it will go for. You at this college must develop on that concept. Bright Wamirama followed this concept, and in Parliament, they went to Egypt, they had rounds of negotiations, they were hoodwinked at the end, because the Egyptians told them that most of their water comes from Ethiopia, and Ethiopia was giving them free. But the reason I brought that water was, is that you develop this concept. You need water more than you need oil. You can't drink oil and survive. You need water. Your body is 76% water. You are conceived through water, and we have fresh water. We must sell this water to people. Ah, but I am paying for water in Kampala. If I am paying for water in Kampala, how are the Arabs of Egypt getting it free? And you allow that to happen? Don't you see I have a lot of quarrels with you people? Eh? <laughs> National water, every time they come and cut my water off, you let the whole water just flow and interrupt them to Egypt. No. You have the resources you have. We found these resources. We have them for a particular strategic reason and we must utilize it. So, Mel Chimaka, I end with the words of Hannibal. When he crossed the Arabs with few Africans against 80,000 Romans before he fought at the Battle of Cana. And he says that we have come this long and this far. The elephant has, that brought us have since died. In front of us stand the Roman army that wants both our swords and our blood. It is such a critical struggle, for if we lose, we are lost forever. We must find a way or we make one. We stand at the eve and at the brink of delicate times. The war that are being fought now are what we call final solution. Hitler attempted it, he was not successful. European nations have carved up Africa. France is supposed to colonize West Africa through Ivory Coast. Britain and, uh, and, and Spain are supposed to take North Africa through Libya. America is supposed to have military bases all across up South Africa. That's why you see they are now trying to get a good relationship and hook up with their Jewish cousins at the tip of Africa. South Africa, Cape Town, is owned by Jews. Jews. And they keep blacks in a ghetto called Kalicha. It is almost bigger than ginger. You won't see black people when you go to Cape Town. So they want to hook up with them. So they recolonize Africa. They are building a big military base in Chisangani all the way to the airport plus a couple of scattered bases everywhere. We have oil. Do not take this lightly. You have seen America invade other countries for oil. You have seen it invaded for resources. The Haina is hungry. He is looking for something to eat. And standing between them is you men of Chimaka. If you should stumble, if you should stammer and falter, then we will be lost forever. But if you should check these challenges and look back at our history, and some of the heroes that we recall and bring to the fore, if you should remember recent battles of people like Chetswayo Kampande Zulu at the Battle of Isandwana, of the Abun and Menelik at the Battle of Adwa, 1886, same time, you know, for Chetswayo. If you should remember, you know, uh, the Africans in the fore, you know, who beat off you know, different, uh, you know, Arab invasions. If you should remember Samori Turi, if you should remember Ya Asantewa, if you should remember in Angola, you know, if you should remember Amina of Zaria, and Tusara Vetua, and, uh, and Desili, if you should remember Africans in Bahia and Paramaris, like Louis Gama and Gibran Prosa, then 
we should write our name on the cloud of eternity and other generations will remember us and think they leave the people who fought so bravely, who loved so delicately, and they restored their dignity and the continuity of their people and their race. I thank you very much. The doctor has been gracious enough to make this package available to the college. I'll make sure it is bound properly and placed in the library so you'll be uh, free to go at any time and borrow any one of them that you'd like to watch, perhaps even over these people. You can watch them uh, during your, your course break and then come back refreshed. The idea of having people like uh, the doctor come and give us presentations at the end of the term is so that you can go back home in this period with some food to think about. So by the time you come back for the next term, you are better rejuvenated to start the term you know, on a better front. So doctor, we thank you so much for what you have done for us, for the quick response also, uh, because we know we gave you very short notice, but we know your love for the military, and most especially what you have told us today certainly augurs very well with the trends of events of today, and uh, the necessity for us to be more awake and cognizant of what is happening, so that we can prepare ourselves better, and prepare the communities better for tomorrow. Thank you very much for having come. But again, thank you very much. And God bless. We have benefited a lot. Okay. Mm. Because since you, since you see now the, the, the lecture has pointed out uh, how we are supposing to behave as Africans. That is, that is, that, that is something very important. Very important. Okay. Yes. Any message you'd like to, uh, to portray to other people? Uh, other people, you know, people, we have got different societies. But for the African societies, the message is they should learn their origin and respect their cultures. We have learned a lot about our, how, how important Africans we are. And I have realized that we have still a wars to fight, there is st still battles to fight, because they have, the doctor brought it well that uh, we are really oppressed and we don't know, because you can see someone laughing at you but yet you don't know what is inside his heart, we have learned a lot. Okay. Mm. Any word of encouragement to the people outside here? I encourage them to to defend our continent, in fact, the continent, the Africa, the Afri the continent of Africa, and to take to, to 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 put it in mind that we must work for our continent, and we must uh, try to forward this information to our children. They we inform them even to transfer to transfer the message to the, their children when they are still young. They grow up knowing what to do. Good lesson for African society. Mm, I think we have learned a lot of today. Okay. Yes. Uh, any, any words for the people outside there? Mm, I think the best for people outside is that we should trace our history and we follow exactly what the history is all about so that we will be in the position of knowing our history and we shall be in the position of protecting when we, what we know. Well, your son worked on the genographic projects uh, yes. with National Geographic and IBM. Yes. They carried out the Y, the genographic projects, looking at the Y chromosome. Yes. That is the, you know, the, the, the gene that we inherit from our parents and is passed on from father to father yes. to, to, ch to child, looking at the scientific Adam. Mm. Now, uh, what did your son tell you who worked on this project? Uh, he has brought out very clearly that the entire humankind, the, the entire population of this planet has originated from Africa. That all of us can, tra our, can trace our ancestry back to the Adam who originated here in Africa. It is from Africa that the migration started out. And the uh, Y chromosome, chromosome has shown a specific markers which show that the migrations have been from Africa outwards. And the population of the earth today mm. 
has got its origins here in Africa, mm. and that the uh, the entire the entire globe mm. has been populated from Africa. Mm. How if if African people knew this information, uh, what do you think it would do to their psychology? It is uh, the uh, the more advanced mm. countries claim a lot of firsts yes. and take a lot of pride in it. Yes. However, it is for African people to realize the, their psychology to realize mm. that entire mankind has originated from Africa. Mm. One, and the second point being that the first tools, which by which today man, mankind has produced such weapons mm. Mm. or such uh, industrial tools, mm. originated here in Africa, mm. and that the first steps which mankind took to navigate the globe, mm. originated here in Africa, mm. and then it is from here that the entire uh, global population has the population. The population of the globe. Uh, the globe has taken place. As a, as a father, hmm. how does it make you feel that your son worked on such a project of total great importance? See, for me, it was an eye opener hmm. to realize that the that this is how that I am actually originated from here from Africa, hmm. and that maybe the Asian race or the white race or hmm. any race hmm. has come from here in Africa. Hmm. And the second issue is that after listening to you, mm. I was reinforced, mm. my point was reinforced mm. that it is not knowledge which is only with me. Mm. It is with people all over this place and especially mm. with you. Mm. And as a matter of fact, after listening to you, I could actually understand mm. what is meant in that information. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right off.